Son into the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Merciful Father, you sent your only begotten Son, who by his life in parables taught us about your fatherly love. Make us worthy to celebrate today your great mercy as revealed in the parable of the prodigal son who repented and returned to his father. Like him, bring us back from the exile of sin to your fatherly house, that we may glorify you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with the church and her children. Praise, glory, honor, and praise to the merciful Father who loves all people and accepts their repentance, and to the beloved Son who became man, invited all people to his Father's house, and to the Holy Spirit who enlightens our hearts and consciences. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. Christ our God, you are the true light who has come into the world. You are the way that leads to the Father, and no one comes to the Father except through you. You showed us your love when you lived among us, and you told us of the Father's compassion and his love for repentant sinners. You spoke to us of repentance, of mercy, and of living water. Today we meditate on the parable of the prodigal son, who, trusting his father, turned from his life of corruption and repented of his sin. Now, O Lord, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to have compassion on us as you have compassion on all sinners. May we humble ourselves before you and repent of all our sins. Enlighten us that we may know you. Strengthen us with your power and do not turn your holy face away from us, lest the darkness of sin surround us. Send your spirit to us, sinners, during this forgiving season of Lent, so that we may return to you seeking forgiveness. Open your blessed arms to us and bring us close to you, so that we may meet you with joy and find happiness in knowing you. Be our strength and our help that we may ever glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever.
Accept our incense and the forgive for the forgiveness of our sins. May those who have strayed from your fatherly house return there, that they may ask for pardon and forgiveness, as as for us, your weak children. Strengthen us and our resolve to remain with you and glorify you forever. Amen. Second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, examine yourselves to see whether you are living in faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. I hope you will discover that we have not failed, but we pray to God that you may not do evil, not that we may appear to have passed the test, but that you may do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth but only for the truth. For we rejoice when we are weak, but you are strong. What we pray for is your improvement. I am writing this while I am away, so that when I come, I may not have to be severe in the virtue of the authority that the Lord has given me to build up and not to tear down. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Mend your ways. Encourage one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the holy ones greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. 
Praise be to God always. Praise, honor, and glory the most holy trinity. We're in this in a sense. Kyrie de Son. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Luke, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen and give glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The Lord Jesus says, a man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, Father, give me the share of your estate that should come to me. So the father divided the property between them. After a few days, the younger son collected all his belongings and he set off to a distant country where he squandered his inheritance on a life of dissipation. When he had freely spent everything, a severe famine struck that country, and he found himself in dire need. So he hired himself out to one of the local citizens, who sent him off to his farm to tend the swine. And he longed to eat his fill from the slop on which the swine fed, but nobody gave him anything. Coming to his senses, he thought, How many of my father's hired hands have more than enough to eat, but here I am, dying from hunger. I shall get up and go to my father, and I shall say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But treat me as you would treat one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went off back to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father had caught sight of him and was filled with compassion. And he ran out to his son, he embraced him and he kissed him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. But his father ordered his servants, quickly, bring the finest robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and take the fattened calf and slaughter it. Then let us celebrate with a great feast because this son of mine who was dead has come again to life. He was lost, and now he has been found. Then the celebration began. Now the older son, who had been out in the field, and on his way back to the house, as he neared, he heard the sound of music and dancing. He called one of the servants, and he asked him what this might mean. The servant said to him, Your brother has returned, 
and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back now safe and sound. And he became angry and he refused to enter the house. His father came out and he pleaded with him. And he said to his father in reply, look, all these years I have served you and not once did I disobey your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat to feast on with my friends. But when this, your son returns, who swallowed up your property with prostitutes and wanton living, for him you slaughter the fattened calf. And he said to him, my son, you are here with me always. Everything I have is yours. But now we must celebrate and rejoice because your, fa your brother who was dead has come to life again. He was lost and now has been found. This is the truth, peace be with you. For although he was crucified out of weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God in your eyes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Pope Benedict XVI when he was Pope, and even before that, when he was Cardinal back in the 90s, called great attention to a resurrected, erroneous view among Christians. Its name properly is Pelagianism, because it's named after a Welsh monk back in the 400s, whose name was Pelagius, and a great adversary to St. Augustine. What Pelagius taught was that grace helped us, kind of brought a little more ornamentation, but was not necessary for salvation. It's based upon the naturalistic view that everyone basically is all right. And that what grace comes to do is kind of like polish it a little better. And the reason why this is considered erroneous by the church and has been for centuries is because it empties the whole work of redemption. It empties the value of why God entered the world and died upon Calvary for our redemption. If it's just a question of, pol of polishing, why would our Lord have ever gone through that torture? The church has always understood that this death and resurrection is central to the whole reality of the gospel. And that grace is not just a polishing. Grace is not just simply an extra help for some people to kind of be a little bit better. Grace is absolutely essential to save our souls. Without grace, we go to hell. That is the woundedness of original sin. So what St. Paul is doing here in this letter, because when we first hear it, this is the end of his second letter to the Corinthians. And as we mentioned last week, there seems to be a third letter, which Paul we came in between these two, that we no longer have. So St. Paul is, in a sense, summing up this whole vision of the Corinthians. And if you remember, the Corinthians, there was a small faction, a minority, but a faction within the parish of Corinth that was causing all kinds of problems. They didn't like Paul. They didn't like the way he spoke. They didn't like the way he looked. You know, there were other more polished ministers coming around, more apostles coming around. They didn't like him. 
The problem is, and St. Paul is summing this up, is that they were judging him on natural appearances. What was there? Because even if St. Paul was four foot ten, who cares? I'm not saying he was four foot ten, but even if he was, who cares? That has nothing to do with grace. But because of the naturalism, which is our temptation always, and it is prevalent, you know, Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, was not incorrect trying to point this out. This is our idea that everyone is kind of going to heaven, and some of us happen to be Christians. That somehow Christianity gave us something a little nicer to do in the middle of the winter with Christmas. But grace is absolutely essential for this redemption. We are mortally wounded by the fault of Adam and Eve. And by saying we are mortally wounded means we die. Not just a natural death, but we die for eternity. So that's why when St. Paul is writing to him, on one hand, this is very harsh. And he's saying, I'm writing to you now with the authority I have as an apostle so that when I come to you again, I don't have to be severe. But other than that phrase in this epistle today, there is great hope in this epistle. Because what St. Paul is reminding the Corinthians is that redemption is in small things and within our weakness. In other words, God saves humanity not in spite of their weakness, but in their weakness. We have these references continue within our prayers throughout the entire year, the Husoye, and within the Anaphoras, the weakness. So that what St. Paul is saying to them is, that's why I quoted actually at the beginning of the sermon this verse four. It's not in your bulletin because it's not actually part of the citation, part of the quotation we're reading today. But he first talks about our Lord. For although he was crucified out of weakness, he dies as man on Calvary. He has been scourged. I was mentioning to, one, to someone on Friday evening, if you go to Jerusalem today, there's Armenian Catholic Church at the fourth station of the cross, our Lord meeting his afflicted mother. This Armenian Catholic, it's a hospice, it's a, it's a hostel, but it has a church attached, a very ancient church commemorating the fourth station. In fact, the original church is about 25 feet under the building that's there now because, well, in 20 centuries, everything's kind of moved up. But what is interesting is the name of this church is Our Lady of the Spasm. Not very poetic, but very profound in telling you because the tradition behind it is that the An Anatonia was around the corner where our Lord was condemned and he would have been coming down one of these alleyways before turning into this road. And this is where the mother of God was waiting. She knew the trial was going on. And that when he came around the corner, this is the first time she had seen him from before Passover. And in that time, he's been arrested, he's been beaten, he's been spit upon, he's been crowned with thorns, he's been scourged, he's been humiliated, he's been losing blood for these last 12, 14 hours. And so when he comes around the corner and she sees her baby for the first time, she goes into, as the title says, Our Lady of the Spasm. The complete shuddering of her entire body to see the wretched condition of her son after these last 18 hours. And so St. Paul is reminding us he's crucified in weakness. He chooses freely to enter into this and yet he lives now in the power of God and the power of the resurrection. And he says, for we are weak also within him but we shall live together with him by the power of God. And then he adds this phrase, in your eyes. Which sounds funny at first. So what he's saying to the Corinthians, he's saying, look, I hope now after this exchange of letters, these, these rebukes back and forth, the attempt, that you're beginning to understand the path of the gospel. And so that you understand that we live by the power of God. And that's why it says, in your eyes, do you see differently now? 
Two years ago, you didn't see well. Three years ago, you didn't see well. You're complaining because I'm four foot ten. And so he's saying, but now do you understand that it's not in spite of being weak? It is through that weakness that God conquers by his grace. And Mrs. McGillicuddy is not going to heaven just because she happens to make brownies for the children on Valentine's Day for the local elementary school. That's very sweet. It's very nice. It makes her a nice lady in the neighborhood. It has nothing to do with whether she's going to go to heaven or not. This is what the Pope was trying to make us understand of our naturalistic understanding. It's that naturalism and the Pelagianism which has sapped any energy from our, what used to be historically and one of the characteristics of the church of being missionary, of bringing this therapeutic grace of redemption and salvation to others because we all need it. They need it just as much as I do. And that vision was always that we tried to bring this Therapy, this grace, this redemption to them. And St. Paul is saying, by spinning it on its head, saying, the Corinthians, you were complaining about things, which may be complainable about if you want, on a natural level, but they have nothing to do with the work of grace and the apostolate. And only when we understand that, then we understand that it's within the weakness that God accomplishes these transformations, not in appearances. And that's why when you look at the parable of the prodigal son. The son only converts when he reaches the absolute depths of depravity, morally and physically. He's starving. He's wasted his whole inheritance. He still has no inheritance, even going back to the farm. Everything belongs to his brother because he's already taken his part of the inheritance. He has been stripped of everything, and it's in that moment that he now sees in wisdom clearly by grace. Grace is that radical transformation that takes place in weakness, in suffering. Yesterday was the Feast of St. Rafka, and I know when I preach, I always point to the doors. It's because of the window, of course, over, over the doors outside. <laughs> It's, well, it's kind of funny because I've mentioned her a few times in the last couple of months and I will point to the doors and everyone will dutifully look at the doors and then we're thinking, well, okay. But of course, St. Rafka, and I mentioned in the bulletin a couple of weeks ago, when we read the lives of the saints, it's oftentimes only the last 20 years of their life. Because the first 30, 40, 50 years, they've just been faithful day in and day out, trying to collaborate with this grace. Nothing significant, nothing huge. And that's why someone like St. Teresa of Lisieux, point to the window in the back, St. Teresa of Lisieux at the age of 24 that she reaches this profound transformation of grace is such a miraculous thing because we're used to seeing this weakness which collaborates with grace and then will flourish in those last two decades. That's St. Rafka. She's about 53 when she asks for that grace of understanding our Lord's passion. And then, of course, we know the rest of the story, her blindness, her paralysis, her cancer, you know, for the last next 20 years. So God, very clearly, for a woman who dies in 1914, very clearly wants the modern world not to fall into naturalism and into Pelagianism. She is a vehicle of grace. We've mentioned the sisters carry her. When 12 of them go to found a new convent, they carry Sister Rafka with them. She can't do physically anything on a natural level within that convent. But these women have the faith and they know she's the most important member we have in this convent. Because in that weakness, in that blindness, in that paralysis, God is at work to give this understanding of the passion. And this is clearly a gift to us in the modern world. Like I said, she only died in 1914. This is not a medieval story. And so what St. Paul is reminding them, he says, that's why he then says, since the beginning of the quotation today, test yourselves. Where are you in this path of grace? Test yourselves, if you be within the faith, are you living this proclamation of the gospel? And he says, prove yourself. And of course, the word probing, proving, testing, and of course, we have teachers, and I taught for decades in schools too. When you hear the word test, we think, okay, papers, 
torture, memorizing lists, and then I get a grade. All right, we all hated it. But that's not really the test. What you're actually doing is finding out what's in this little critter's head. That's what we're doing with the test. The test is not the paper. The test is, well, we're probing. Is there anything in there or is it empty? Which by as an aside, one of the reasons why the Jesuit education was so brilliant for the last centuries is because they taught in order to make teachers. You taught in such a way, not just simply, please puke up on this paper a list of something. There are definitely teachers in this chapel. <laughs> but not so much just simply to regurgitate something, but to be able to explain back what I have given you. It's much harder to do that. And so what St. Paul is saying, look, we've gone through these last two years quite painfully to the Corinthians. And he's saying, test yourselves, ask yourselves, are you living this life of grace now? Have you come to understand it? Prove this. Prove yourselves, probe what is actually going on within you. And that's why he immediately says, because there's nothing we can do against truth, but only for truth. The reality is always going to come out in the laundry, right? It's always going to come out in the wash. It's always going to come out on the day of judgment in any case. So prove yourself now. Look to see where you're at. And then he has this very funny phrase <clears throat> where he says, along the, something along these lines, he says, well, I would like that you're actually showing yourselves to be good Catholics, to be good Christians, because it makes me look good. But I'm not asking you to fake looking good, even if it makes me look good. I'd rather have you be good and me still look like an idiot. So that's when he says, because for truth, we can never do anything against truth, but only for the truth. And that's the same, we could echo that here, you know. I'd rather be considered the worst priest on the face of the earth, but leave behind at least a handful of vibrant Catholics in Waterville who have all of a sudden gone to the depth of what the great tradition and grace and redemption and salvation truly mean. That's what St. Paul's saying. That's his purpose. Even if I look bad, as long as you are truly good, profoundly transformed by grace, that's fine. And so he says, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is within you? Unless perhaps you are reprobates. Now I think it's translated in the, in the gospel saying, and I think the same translation I put down was, unless of course you're without faith. But that's not, actually not the term St. Paul uses. Adokimoi, adokimos is the word he uses in Greek. And the word actually means reprobate, that you're cast off by God, which is much stronger than saying, well, maybe your faith isn't as strong as it should be. No, he's saying you're chucked off. So that do, not, do you not know that Christ Jesus is working within you, unless perhaps you're reprobates? And so what he's saying here is that, of course, the mystery of the prodigal son is that grace is often working when our lives seem to be in their worst place. When things are not working, when you're not baking brownies for the local elementary school because you're on your back sick. Grace is the moment when those are the places where this works. Not the only place, but it's often the time psychologically the only place it works because as long as everything is tripping along really well, I think I'm great. I think I'm a good person. I think everything's wonderful. And so I'm definitely going to heaven because I'm a good person. That is not the gospel. The gospel is we are all need as the prodigal son of understanding the mercy and compassion of the father. But sometimes the father has to allow us, sometimes we really individually, personally have to be feeding slopping pigs before we understand that we need the compassion of the father. That's the meaning of this parable. And so that's why it's joined together with this letter of St. Paul. And that's why he says, to finish up, he says, we rejoice. We rejoice that we are weak. We rejoice that we are a puny number in this little parish. Not because it's puny, but because when the fidelity and the miracle and the grace and the compassion of God our Father flourishes, 
the traditions of Antioch throughout central Maine, it will be all the more miraculous, won't it? The miracle of the resurrection of our Lord on the day of Easter is so much more glorious when you've been the mother of God of the spasm, when you know how horrible things were before. And grace can work because we no longer have this naturalistic Pelagian vision of self-sufficiency and just simply try to bob along. So St. Paul says, we rejoice that we are weak and that you are strong. There's a bit of an irony in this. And he says, but this also we're praying for your perfection, that you move from this previous critical spirit of naturalism in the first letter to the Corinthians and the move from the infancy to the maturity of Christians who see the profundity of grace. And that's why he finishes in this full flourishing of this beautiful aspect. And therefore, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the charity of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is the liturgical benediction. This is the beginning of the anaphora. All of the Catholic churches have taken this text to be the liturgical blessing within their Eucharistic prayers, within their masses. So he begins by starting something saying, it's in weakness that God works most efficaciously. But that's all right. Because the act of compassion means that it doesn't matter what my life is, how insignificant, how sick, how untalented I may think myself. It's in that littleness that God's grace and God's compassion works. Which means none of us have an excuse of not becoming a saint. We don't have to do anything great. We have to be great. And it's in that smallness, which is why you can link together those two verses, that we rejoice because we are weak, but our prayer is still to arrive at perfection. So that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and this charity of God which flows down to us and this communion and fellowship within the divine spirit of God's eternal love, the Holy Spirit, be with us and among us all. The magnificent vision of what Lent is meant to be, this transformation in compassion and grace to bring us into perfection. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is the glory and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess in one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And we look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Itelot made pedolo, Walvoto lo hod and hard at a youth. We have so good I would talk, I will let the bite of a spud of high a blow, what for a show. Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you. Out of their love for you and for your holy name, shower your spiritual blessings upon them. And in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life in your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Charbel. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered for the repose of Father Puri. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
continue on page 774, the Anaphora St. Peter, 774. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. O Father, God of peace and Lord of security, make us worthy to embrace one another with a sincere kiss in the spirit of your unending love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to you, only Son, and to you, Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. before you to receive your blessings and assistance for we are weak and you are the support and refuge of all we raise glory to you to your only son and to your holy spirit now and forever amen O oh lord may the light of your face shine upon us deliver us from every evil and blot out all our transgressions that we may raise glory and thanks to you to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly it is right and just to glorify and exalt you, O maker of all creation. With the angels we glorify you, and with voices of praise we cry out and we proclaim. in mercy because of your love for us you sent your son into the world and he became flesh of the virgin mary for our salvation <speaking in Hebrew> Waxoya Bilitalamita Kado Mara Sabahola Mehene Kulho O no Denita Bahuru Di Dahlo Faikun Wahlov Sagi Metapaseo Meti Hem 
حسین حامی و خای در قلم علمی سادم سیخ و من حمر و من مایون بارخ و قادش یا بل تلمی دا کار و مارا سابش دا و مهنه پل خون و دنی تا دم و دیر دیاتی کی خدا تو دخلو فای کون و خلاف ساقیم میتن شد و میتی هم خوسون خامه و خاین در قلم علمین And he then commanded and instructed them, saying, Each time you celebrate these holy mysteries, you remember my death and resurrection until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We confess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. O oh Lord, we remember your coming that saved us, and as we await your second coming, we offer you praise and ask you, on the day when you will judge the righteous and sinners, do not condemn us because of our sins, but have compassion and mercy upon us. Turn your holy face away from our sins and assist us. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you, Implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us. O oh Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we profess our faith in you, and we ask you, have compassion on us, O oh God. Have mercy on us and hear us. How awesome is this moment, O my beloved, for the living Holy Spirit descends and rests upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Anin morio, anin morio, anin morio, nite mod rojo chayu kadisho. Unachinalainu al korbono hono. That by his descent he may make this bread the body of Christ our God. Make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May those who share in these holy mysteries be cleansed body and soul, and from every sin and receive eternal life. Amen. O Lord, accept our intercessions and prayers and grant security to your people and peace to your flock. Protect our shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Ashada Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Nisralo Peter, our retired Patriarch, Gregory John, our Bishop. Assist the priests, the deacons, and all those who serve your Holy Church, so that they may intercede and pray to you on our behalf. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord of goodness, your holy church, and have mercy on all her faithful. In your compassion, heal all the wounded and injured among your flock. Punish injustice and strengthen all our brothers and sisters. Bestow the grace of conversion on all. With your indestructible power, strengthen the bishops of the true faith, that they may be upright and courageous in their apostolic office. May they show fidelity as they stand ever before your eternal justice. 
unto your honor and glory. May they prove themselves upright, dauntless, and persevering in the task confided to them to lead all the faithful into the fullness of your redeeming light and glory. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember those who have asked us to pray for them, those who desired but were unable to make an offering, and those who assist your holy church. Be a shelter and refuge for them, for you are the Savior of all. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the civil leaders in our country and throughout the world. Enlighten their consciences to bring security and peace to your people. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, St. Joseph, St. Jude, St. Marin, and St. Charbel, and all the saints, assist us through their prayers and make us worthy of their reward. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the righteous fathers and teachers who have gone to their rest among the saints. Remember those who diligently carried your holy gospel throughout the whole world and confirmed your holy church in the true faith. Assist us through their prayers and strengthen us in your love. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O oh Lord, our brothers, our parents, brothers and sisters, teachers and all the faithful departed here and everywhere have gone to their rest. Forgive us and forgive them of all sins and offenses. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O oh God, to the departed, and forgive the sins we have committed. With or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. God the Father, you strengthen and encourage us, for we are weak. We implore you to purify us from every sin and to accept our offering, so that in one spirit we may call upon you praying, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. O Lord, lead us not into the trials of temptation that we do not have the strength to overcome, but deliver us from every evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace be with you. Bow your heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of it, and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, bless your worshipers who bow before you and implore you. Make them worthy of your mercy and forgive their sins. For you are almighty and rich in compassion. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. The grace of the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one holy, holy Father, Father, one holy Son, one, one holy Spirit. Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for a new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
Lord, and we thank you, my Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body and blood to drink, living blood to drink, a lover of all people. Have mercy on us.
thank you, O oh Father, for this gift that you have given us, though we are unworthy. Do not shame us because of our sins, but help and save us, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Lord Jesus, stretch forth your right hand and bless your people. Protect them by your holy cross, be their shelter and refuge, and perfect them with your abundant blessings that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your blessed Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. So we have just two announcements to call attention to the bulletin, especially this week, because Bishop Gregory asked us to put a notification of a film that's appearing this weekend, and so that's in the bulletin, this upcoming film. And the second is that we have also the Patriarch's Letter for Lent. It actually is from last Lent, but it took them the entire Lenten season to translate it from Arabic. So it was sent to me during Easter week, which I thought was kind of, un, you know, it was missed the point. So we saved it for this year, and we're using the text for commentary for this last week and this week um, during the adult religion classes um, on Wednesday evenings. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and the blessings that you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Thank you.